let's go ahead and get started then. Uh, I don't even have like a beginning. How do, how do you even start this? Uh, how do you, how do you experiment, do experiment, I, right. but go with it, honey. Just we'll, go have, with it. we'll have fun. Um, yeah. so, um, my name is Felipe Hinojosa. I'm the editor at Latinx Talk, and it is a great privilege of mine to introduce you all, although maybe you all already know who she is. She is uh, Professor Martha Gonzalez. She is a Chicana artivista, musician, and feminist music theorist. She is an assistant professor in the Intercollegiate Department of Chicana and Chicano and Latino and Latina Studies at Scripps College. Uh, her awards are many and recognitions are many as well. She is a Fulbright a scholar, a Ford Fellow, and a Woodrow Wilson Fellow as well as lead singer for the Grammy award-winning band Quetzal. Um, and really, a uh, just from what I'm reading and getting to know an amazing human being, she is a trained scholar in feminism with a focus on Chicana feminist theory, transnational studies, performance studies, and ethnomusicology. Folks, I could go on and on. She's amazing. Um, it's, it's really an honor to have you with us uh, today, Professor Gonzalez here at Latinx Talk. Thank you so much for having me. Professor great, great. <laughs> <laughs> you can call me Felipe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. All right. Um, so, so we are here, we are here to talk about um, uh, your new book. The title of the book is Chicana Chicano Artivistas, Music, Community, and Trans Border Tactics in East Los Angeles, published by University of Texas Press, just this year in 2020. Uh, Professor Gonzalez, the book is fantastic. Uh, thank you again for making time to, uh, to talk to us uh, today about your book uh, and, and to help promote it uh, here on our website with Latinx Talk. I'm gonna just jump right in. And um, uh, you, you begin the book with what I think is a beautiful and poignant story uh, about your father. Um, and I wonder if you could begin there at the beginning here um, and by asking how it was that your father's own story, uh, his longing really for musical success, as you note, shaped you and prepared you uh, for the work that you accomplish in this book that you, that you just published. Thank you. First of all, thank you um, to not just you, uh, Professor Hinojosa, but also all the colegas that, you know, create spaces like these to discuss our work. It's really important. And um, I feel it's a privilege to be here with you and, you know, that you all even take interest in a, our work is important. And I, I want to recognize that first. Um, yeah, you know, like a lot of people and a lot of scholars, um, you know, I start off uh, from a very personal place, right? My, my early childhood experience in music, uh, most of which was informed by my father. He's, uh, you know, an immigrant from Guadalajara, Jalisco, who really was influenced by his time. And I make that clear throughout, but what I mean by influence is that he really had a longing. Um, he was a creative, person, you know, he was a singer, a very good singer, actually sounded a lot like Javier Solis, or he fashioned his voice in that way, you know, he was the guy to imitate of the times, you know, and uh, Jorge Negrete as well. And so my dad, when he arrived here, he was young, he must have been like 16, 17 years old, and really still had that longing for music and to be a professional musician. Um, and, you know, I think that migration is done out of necessity. Um, he, like many of his time were, you know, um, you know, e economic refugees, right? They're running from not um, very many opportunities in where he was from and um, in coming over here, he kind of followed his mom who had left many years before to work. And so, uh, but he still brought his dreams with him, right? Of being a professional ranchera singer. And, um, Unfortunately for my dad is that he never, what they call, you know, as nunca se acopló, right? And he never um, got used to this life. He never really fit in. He never finished high school. He kind of tried to, he enrolled in people, he never really finished. Um, you know, everything about this culture didn't, was very foreign to him. 
-hmm. you know, um, you know, love happened. He met my mom, you know, it was kind of a shotgun wedding. He started having family, a family before he knew it. And before he knew it, you know, we had, there were four of us and, uh, but he, it never, you know, subsided his need for the dream, right. To be a professional singer, you know, and all that that came with, right. Economic and social prestige, you know, economic wealth, social prestige. And, um, and unfortunately for a lot of folks and not to mention coming from a household that was traumatic, you know, he was traumatized and then he became an alcoholic, right. Um, alcoholism became his thing. And he sort of, um, I think built a world around this, what this meant, the world of professional music and, but in and around his dabbling in alcohol and then my brother growing up and suddenly he realized that my brother had some sort of musical talent he begins to recognize that you know he's vicariously begins to live through my brother's successes right so this that's kind of where the book starts and i'm really looking at in in that that's kind of like a micro look at what i'm looking at right the micro look and the stories i tell throughout are about the change of music conception over time Right. For somebody like me, these are my early music memories that slowly begin to be um, that were traumatic in a lot of ways, very informative and culturally uh, very rich, um, but also traumatic and a different way of seeing music that in retrospect, after all of these other experiences I have throughout in my life and community, not just in the trenches of East L.A., but also in Chiapas, Mexico and Veracruz. Um, you know, all the ways in which um, my father's belief system begin to be undone. So it's change of music conception over time. And that's like the micro look at all the different stories and the narratives I tell throughout. But I think that when you zoom out, the big picture um, or the macro look is really a critique on capitalism, right? And how it has fundamentally altered um, what I believe and um, it has fundamentally altered how we think about our cre ourselves as creative beings, how it's um, overdetermined by capital and consumption, and how that has intrinsically affected how we relate to each other, right? Yeah. So in, in an essence, we know that capitalism has had a global breakdown of cultures and, and people and communities but we never really stop to think about how it has individually affected us and how mass migration and wars and all the ways in which capitalism has had its bearing and its way with us, right? That we, these practices that we have let go have, have been detrimental to us spiritually and emotionally to the point where, um, you know, we, we are sort of blinded with all these other things that capital sells us, right? And so, my goal is to get the reader to realize, I guess to sort of maybe ignite a kind of appetite for participatory music and dance practices, which I call them throughout. And then I describe different methods and how these community experiences um, gave way to these methods that I now utilize, so. <laughs> So that's great. You know, one of the things that I that I really admired about what you did in the book is that you were able to weave really well and probably better than than a lot of folks um, uh, is the way that you weave theory and narrative and storytelling. Uh, you do that quite well. And I wonder how is that? Is there any relation to music and making music to the writing process of that sort of kind of eclectic mix? Because people often do theory and think, well, there's no storytelling that can go with it, or it's it's void of story, or vice versa, where you have a story but no sort of theory to help us understand the story. And I wonder what you mm -hmm. how you think about that. That's one of the best questions I've ever had. That's <laughs> awesome. You know what? Yes. And I, you just answered it for me in a way. I mean, first of all, what an honor. Thank you so much for saying that because I feel very, you know, as an artist who goes into academia, of course, there's always, I mean, there's an imposter. I don't know if you have imposter syndrome. There's imposter syndrome for right, all of you. Right, right. But especially, you know, somebody like me who, you know, on a good day, I feel very confident about the fact that as a songwriter, I've always theorized, right? My sto storytelling is a form of theorization, right? We know this from our fields. 
that testimonial, for example, is an important tool, right? And uh, and to me, songs are like a kind of like, like a testimony, right? A way of of getting an audience or people to sort of connect with an idea or ideas, um, with a triumph, aphorism, struggle, right? All of these things that go along with music. So it's no um, accident that, and in my case, as I noticed, and I got more and more into academia, or I was encouraged by other academics who would always interview us as a, as a singer songwriter for Quetzal, I, I, don't, I don't know how many interviews I would do a year with academics that would write about our music, oh, right? Yeah. And they would That's start true. their chapter, right? And they'd start their chapter with lyrics. Chapters, yeah, I've certainly come across uh, Quetzal in, in academic writing, yeah. Exactly. So, so folks would quote a lyric or they would quote an interview, right? And so by Quetzal Flores or myself and, or, or even if it wasn't our own music, it was somebody else's lyrics, right? Lyricism is an important way into avenue into a greater uh, sort of theoretical framework, right? Or supports it well. So that's not so far fetched, right? But I think that in my case, um, I really felt like I couldn't tell the theory without really going into how I, I related to it, right? Mm -hmm. And I think those examples really came from people before me, right? Andalua, you know, Bell Hooks, Barbara Christian, right? Um, Audrey Lord, like all the storytellers that that and and artists slash writers that begin to sort of come from, it, they start at the root, right? And 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 the root is the personal embodied experience. And because so many of our scholars in our fields have given credence to that, it was less daunt a less daunting task for me to have to go into that. Yeah. Not to mention the fact that I had a very supportive um, dissertation committee who knew who I was and what I was coming in with and that music and art or um, creative writing, so to speak, or, or you know, uh, testimonial was gonna be an important part of how I told the story. Yeah. So I, I think that there were times where I, f I would feel really self-conscious in writing the book and thinking, okay, enough about me. Let me go into like, what I see in the story. Okay, now let me go back to the story. Too much theory, man. Like it, after a while, it was like, okay, I'm getting too heady. Let me go back, you know? And so I'd go back and forth, back and forth. But when I read treaties or, or books that are super high in theory and just like, I'm so impressed with that. I, I, don't, I don't feel like I can do that. So this is my way I think of just um, sort of going back and forth, back and forth in ways that feel comfortable to me and honest in my voice and what I'm able to do with the skill sets I have and, you know, what I'm, I feel honest, um, you know, I try not to perform too much, so to speak, you know. Right, right. yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and, um, and the, the way that the book is organized, you're sort of telling us your story, even as you're sort of making these sort of big, uh, putting out these big ideas about what you call music under capitalism, which I love that sort of phrasing of it. Um, and then also talking to us about cafes and community centers and the ways in which those spaces open themselves up um, for artists. Is that the way you were sort of thinking it up as you were writing this dissertation? Talk to us about that kind of evolutionary process of making the book and getting to that, to that point. Well, I think that I think the methods happened for me first, right? Like I was, we were already engaging in these methods in grad school. And even in grad school, I think that, you know, when you have to, I knew that I wanted to write about my time period, the Chicanos in the nineties and that, that movement, you know, um, uh, Chicano artist activist movement in the nineties. And nobody has really written extensively about it, right? And, um, it's peripherally written about. I can think of a handful of people that have sort of mentioned it, but really people that have been mostly preoccupied with 80s, 70s, the canon, right? Yeah, right. Very exactly. important canon, very important. And I, I always thought about us, um, not us as Quetzal, but also Quetzal and other artists of my generation and people that, that have dedicated their lives to art and music, but in these very different ways, right? They didn't necessarily do only their careers. They've stayed connected to this process-based work that I talk about, that I talk about specifically about the kind of work that we do, but 
there are many others that I could have gone into and just snowballed from there, right? The book could have been a lot longer, but I think that what I try to do is just sort of lay the foundation because I've been, um, you know, publishing articles here and there about other things, you know, for tenure sake. <laughs> um, but, but I feel like um, I hadn't really given a foundational work like the change of music conception over time, the, how the roots affected and what, when I finally experienced something different, how transformative it was for me. And so I kind of worked my way backwards, I would say. I started off with the methods and thinking like, why is this so important? Why is this effective? Why is this, why is, why are communities responding to this in, in these, these important ways? Why is there an entire community that has grown out of Fandango? Why is this so important, right? So working my way back, and as we're studying, you know, learning all these theories and almost everything I learned in the courses that I took, there was always an example, a lived experience that I had. So I think that, I think that dissertation was written backwards. Uh -huh. And then I had to really signal to that very beginning, that first time, the memories I had with my dad, how his presence has affected all of us in the family, how some of us are still recovering from the kind of trauma he inflicted on us, but also how these new ways of being have been liberating, you know, how my son is a totally different kind of musician than I was raised to be, you mm -hmm. know. He's a very uh, well-rounded, he knows, he has two ethics in his mind, he, um, and value systems, and he understands them both clearly, right? And, and he, his world is so different than mine, mine was, you know? Yeah. And, um, yeah, so I don't know if I answered. No, you didn't. It's great. And, and you know, one, one of the things that comes through quite clearly in the book is um, your sort of evolution with these ideas, number one. And I'm wondering, as you're thinking about, the, even thinking about whether or not you're going to go into music uh, because of the experiences at home and all of that, um, I want to sort of go back and take a different angle. When did you know that PhD work in academia were going to be the track that you were going to take? And why? Why would you? I mean, you know what I mean? Like, I wonder when that came, because it sounds to me like you're in the you're in the midst of uh, performances and you're, you talk about in the book doing um, gigs for community organizations and different uh, groups all the time. Um, and I'm putting two and two together thinking about, well, you're also in grad school during this time. Um, so anyway, it's just sort of a jumble question in terms of how you think of how did you think about academic work, how you got to that, and then how did you balance it all out, I suppose. I feel like it's been such an organic process for me. I, I think, you know, like a lot of people, I mean, that, that I think get to academia, you know, it is a question of stability, right? Um, you know, there had been so many years gigging and doing the tour thing that we had never really paid into social security. <laughs> Not like it's gonna matter anymore. Who knows, right? <laughs> Shit's being chipped away real quick. But I realized, you know, there's nothing like having a child to sort of kind of say, oh my God, like, what am I gonna do? And how, the, especially when the child begins to ask in a green room as he's nursing and he says, Que estamos haciendo aquí? Me quiero ir a mi casa. Me quiero ir a mi casa a dormir. You know, and mm -hmm. and I re, a dormir en mi cama. He said, you know, and I remember thinking to my looking at him, and then I look at Quetzal, and I was like, ¿Cómo ves? You know, but I'd already been thinking about it. I love school. I'm a kind of a nerd in the sense that I love to talk about music. I like to. My, my partner and I are always nerding out on things. You know, anything politics. You know rhythms you know it's just it's part of like i'm a like all a lot of us i'm a creative being and so any kind of talk around that kind of stuff is 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 transformative for me and, and i love dabbling in it but um up to up until then like i said i had so many so much contact with different academics you know that over the years you know there were as we'd have interviews and we'd talk and you know, in one of the tours, I had the wonderful Olga Najera Ramirez, mm -hmm. WC's uh, Santa Cruz, um, ask me, she was putting an anthology together for dance. And she said, what you do on the tarima is, which is the wooden platform I dance on as a member of Quetzal. 
She's like, what is, is, it, is it traditional folklorico or what is it that you do? I was like, no, no, it's kind of a mixture because I studied Afro-Cuban music and dance and, and music and dance of Ghana and, and folklorico. I said, so it's kind of a little bit of everything. She's like, that sounds fascinating. Can you write something about that? I'm publishing a, a book, an anthology, but I'm not promising that the art, you know, it'll go in there. I just want to hear what you're thinking. And I was like, yeah, sure. I mean, I love to write. I've kept journals forever. And so I started writing something up and then I'd send it to her on tour. I'd write in a book, type it up, send it. So we went back and forth like that. And at the end, she said, you know what, this, we can publish this, we should do this. And if you want it to, you can use this as a piece to get to grad school. And I thought, wow, grad school. And I mentioned it to Quetzal and he was like, yeah, sure. He's always been very supportive. And I thought to myself, how would we do that? And he's like, yeah, why not? You know, at some point, Sandino's going to have to be in stationary. We're going to have to start him in school and might as well. We'd been touring since he was like three years old. I mean, since he was born and into three years old. So I knew it was, there was going to be a time where I had to, it was his schedule, not mine, right? Mm -hmm. Ours. And so that's kind of how it timed it out. I applied for, I applied to grad school and for a Fulbright and I received the Fulbright and grad school said, go ahead and take it and come back in a year. They kind of deferred my enrollment. And I was like, that was the best of both worlds. We went to Veracruz, lived there for nine months, came back for the summer in LA. And then we moved to Seattle, Washington, and we were there for about almost six years. Mm. And um, yeah, uh, my advisor knew, uh, and I even met my advisor at a gig. Okay. My, our, our kids were playing together, Michelle Habel, Payan. We, I, it was a Malx gig. Um, I, we were playing for Malx. It, was, it wasn't it was even Quetzal, it was like a trio or a quartet. And my son was playing in the grass. Her daughter came and they were playing together and that's how we met. And mm -hmm. I started talking to her. I've been thinking about going back to school and she's like, come to Washington. And so that's how I got to the University of Washington. And, and I, before then I used to run an after school arts program. I taught fifth, I, fifth um, kindergarten through high school on and off as a, as a substitute teacher for LAUSD. And the way teachers there were treated was horrible. Yeah. Micromanaged. There was no creative sense for the teacher unless they were super senior, like the teachers. And I just realized, like, I love to teach, but I don't want to spend my time, you know, I don't want my hands tied as I'm teaching. And I also don't want to be micromanaged by any, especially LAUSD, right? Yeah. And their system. And so I, I was very discouraged by, I, although I love teaching kids, it, it just wasn't. For me, and so I, I knew that I wanted um, all of the things that come with it, right? The summer's off, um, you know, writing is something, you know, talking about music. If I could talk about music um, and still live in the world of music somehow, why not, you know, while my son's growing up? And then when he gets older and just leaves, then le vale su madre, well, then, you know, then I get to, uh, I'll start doing other things again, I thought. And I really didn't think I'd get a tenure track position. I didn't think I'd ever get tenure. Like it was really crazy. I was very, I feel very lucky. It's a lot of fun for me. It's just, I would say that it's at times it's as much fun as it is to be on stage and to play and write music. Um, it's, a, it's another a way of expression, I think. It's very expressive for me. And, and academia is a lot like the record industry, just yeah. FYI. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, think about it. We perform. That's right. Right? We have to That's right. we have to promote our own stuff. Like we have to like it's the same thing. Yeah. You know, and it's like <laughs> you have to write a book, but you don't get paid for it. Right. It's a it's a lot, it's a smart, it's the same market system in a way, right? So it makes sense, but there are other things that I think are are you know, we could use to our advantage. And some of those things is the kind of flexibility we get and things. And I was thinking of my family, I'm thinking of my kid, I'm thinking of all the things that I want to keep, you know, being there for him and providing until he doesn't need me anymore. And then si todavía, si no me gusta, I would have left a long time ago, you know, yeah. I, I could do other stuff, you know, but I enjoy sure. it. Good. When the, in in the book, um, there's a lot certainly going on. And I wonder if for our listeners, what are some key takeaways that you would like for them to really, um, you know, think about? I mean, I know that there are uh, academics that will certainly consider assigning your book. It's a fabulous book. You should definitely assign it. Great theoretical insight, wonderful storytelling. 
What are some of the two or three takeaways that you want people to, uh, to grab from, uh, from the book, whatever ideas um, that you want them to take? I want us to realize the depths of how capitalism has affected how we think about ourselves as creative beings. You know, we know it, it's, a, it's a huge, it's a social institution as much as it is an economic one, right? And we, I feel like we don't think enough about the social part. Um, and particularly how it has altered communities in really uh, deep ways. Mm -hmm. Our entire social fabric has been overdetermined by transactions, you know, transactional relationships, you know, and, um, you know, you most for with rare occasions, you know, most of how we think about music is something we buy or we sell, right? But rarely do we think about music, art and culture as just being in community with others, where there is no transaction, economic transaction at all taking place. It's just the way we spend time with each other. I want us to think back to those ways. And if we don't have those, if you don't have those at the ready, I think it's important enough for us to invent them because people have done it before in our generations, hip hop and cypher, the cypher, from the cypher, hip hop is born. And then the industry, industry took it and everybody thinks it's just hip hop. But hip hop came with, you know, like the cypher, you know, um, emceeing, turntablism, right? And graffiti art, like, you know, granted, gente pobre, right? Like yeah. super disenfranchised, right? And then the industry comes along and takes it, but they're not the ones that make the money, right? right. So, but so we know that capital can sell anything, you know, they'll come in and they'll do that, but that's the danger, right? I think that we need to create participatory music and dance practices or re reinvent them or reach back into our cultural legacies as people, as human beings to bring them back into the forefront to get people to do this. I think if we had more of that, we would have less mental illness. Mm less depression, um, more communication between communities, um, more dialogue. We'd be better neighbors, perhaps, you know. I'm not saying that it doesn't come with problems, you know. Uh, no, come even your, in your own family, there's never just harmony, right? But I do think that there'd be a different way of, of just being in community with people. And, you know, and I think it would, it could really solve a lot of our problems. And I think that for us, and especially some of the methods that I talk about, like Pandango, for example, it becomes a kind of social movement, you know, where we don't have to just think about social movement as the picket line and the yeah. boycott and the marches, these things that extract so much energy from us, right? They also give us energy, but for the most part, it's very taxing and very, we're all, those are methods that we use to put out fires, right? These, and we need to react to these things, right? But I think we also need to spend our time building community around these practices that are generative, right? That aren't just taking and sucking energy from us, right? We need to build that world we want to see when all of this else fails, you know, or when government fails us, right? As we have seen them do for everybody else, for so many people, Black people, you know, uh, poor uh, disenfranchised communities in general, right? Look at Katrina, look at you know, women and, and children in cages, look at like government is, you know, that's not, they're not gonna save us, you know? I think that we need to build that world that, that begin to really build it, like not just react all the time, but like really build that world. And I think that music is always at the center of those kinds of things. Yeah, you know? Music has always been important to us and in these specific ways, and we need to put that muscle memory back into our spirit. Thank you so much for that. That's um, certainly, I think, a lot to to think about, and I think it relates a lot to. I mean, I'm not a musician, but an academic, and the way that I sort of the, the way that you describe the record industry and academia in those sorts of ways. Um, you know, one of the things that I try to remind myself is something you just said right now, which is, you know, and you say in the book is redefining whatever thought process we have around success. What does it mean? You know, when when you're there at the well organized, as you say, Grammy Awards, um, uh, you're still trying to get health insurance. You're still trying to find gigs, and you're still trying to see, you know, how you're going to make 
payments that are going to come down uh, the road and so forth. And so um, those, are, I think, are, are certainly inspiring things to, to think about. Um, the book is Chicano Artivistas, Music, Community, and Trans-Border Tactics in East Los Angeles, published by the University of Texas Press uh, this year in 2020. Professor Gonzalez, I have one more question for you. Um, uh, today, we in Texas, I'm sitting here in, in Texas, in, in Central Texas, um, and today is the first day of early voting. There are lines, as you can imagine, everywhere. And there's also, I think, a sense of uh, hope and optimism, even in the midst of the kind of political chaos that, that we live in. I wonder, with all the good work that you have done, what is it that keeps you going and what is it that gives you hope? Mm. Well, there's nothing like being in community with people and um, you know, my, uh, in my own music communities that I belong to, my family, you know, my students, they're amazing, the ways in which they think. Um, and although there isn't always harmony in the community or in the family or, you know, my students, um, sometimes I, you know, I wonder where our youth is going to take us sometimes, you know, I still believe that um that there's a lot of good people out there you know you know so i i feel like um music for me has always been that thing and maybe that's something that my dad always wanted you know maybe that's something he saw but he was just blinded by all of these other things mm -hmm. whenever we feel sad around here or we have a moment when the pandemic first started and to this very day we'll just sit around here and we'll play together. My son, my husband and myself, we just jam out for like an hour, an hour and 30 minutes and not to record, not to play for, you know, online gigs or anything like that. We're just sort of playing and uh, we're working things out or we're, you know, I write a verso or, you know, I think music will always be that expressive thing that, that always, you know, is cathartic, mm -hmm. which, make space in my heart and in my mind to keep that fight up, you know? And um, I'm gonna vote, but I also think it's really important for us after we finish voting to do that other work, that yeah. social work that we really, really need to do. I think that's, that's where we're, you know, that's what allowed the kinds of idiocy that's in the, you know, in government right now I can't even believe what we're living through sometimes. And, but there wasn't enough dialogue. There wasn't enough, you know, on the ground work and that's the stuff we need to keep doing. Yeah, great. The book again is Chicana Chicano Artivistas Music Community and Transborder Tactics in East Los Angeles. I'm gonna look straight into that camera and say, you've got to go get this book published by the University of Texas Press. 2020 <laughs> assign it if you're a historian anthropologist uh whatever musicologist whatever kind of field you're in this book is going to fit because it speaks to our greater humanity and it tells wonderful stories and really and i mean this from the bottom of my heart it's an inspiring book you finish reading the book um feeling ready to go and do the things that are life-giving and so thank you for putting this out into the world and, and sharing this with uh with all of us um, Professor Gonzalez is also, as many of you know, the lead singer of the Grammy award-winning band Quetzal. So check them out, uh, as I was earlier today on lots of really great YouTube videos and things are out there. So, uh, thank you for all the wonderful work you do. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me once again, Felipe. Thank you so much. And I really, again, thank you for having this platform and for discussing all of our work. Great. All right. <laughs>